Hey folks, welcome to another episode of The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. In this one, I talked to journalist and podcaster Jeremy Appel. We talked a bit about the state of journalism, how he got into podcasting, uh, police going after journalists, and the country of Haiti. It was good chat, and I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, Jeremy has a substack titled The Orchard and is a co-host on two podcasts, The Forgotten Corner and Big Shiny Takes. Uh, I will put links to those in the show notes or in the description box of this video, so make sure to go and check them out. So last week, I posted in the Saskatchewan subreddit to see if there were any local leftists interested in joining a group and getting to know one another. Uh, as usual, we, I got a bunch of com reactionaries commenting and basically just spouting off nonsense about echo chambers and cults and socialism never working, and I'm wondering what my listeners and viewers might think is the right answer for looking what for new folks who are interested in leftist politics. Posting on social media seems like the only answer, but really isn't very enjoyable. Uh, I'll keep doing it if I need to, but I don't enjoy dishonest questions, and I don't really like the way that I personally react to them. So yeah, shoot me an email or a comment on the video. Let me know what you think is a good way to reach new people. And lastly, before I send you to the interview, I have to thank all my wonderful patrons. You really make it possible for me to do this show, and if I reach $200 per app per month, I will start paying my guests. Right now, it's tough to justify it with the work that I put into each episode, but if I reach $200 per month, then I can put that towards paying guests or paying Justin once we start doing red reviews again. So if you want to contribute to me being able to pay my future guests, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Support levels start as low as a dollar per month and a dollar fifty for Canadians. If you can't support me with money, then hit the like button or go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube or in the podcast app of your choice as so that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. I know I'm a bit behind all the time with producing new episodes, but all my interviews are available on twitch.tv slash skeptical leftist live and for 14 days. So make sure to follow me there as well so that you can get things as soon as I do them. Otherwise, it's going to take time before for me to edit them and produce them. If I ever get some spare time, I'm going to try and stream more often on Twitch as well and potentially turn those on to uh, into videos on YouTube. You can always feel free to contact me on social media, leave me a comment on YouTube, as long as you don't mind it being public, or you can use the contact form on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or you can email me, mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. That's it for now, on to the interview. So, hi and welcome to uh, The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Jeremy Appel. Uh, thanks for joining me. Yeah, great to be here, Corey. Not Cody. So, not Cody. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's funny because sometimes I'll comment on the Even More News or the Some More News podcast. Uh, uh, Facebook page and people will say, Oh, so now you're commenting in disguise because <laughs> they think I'm Cody, but they just put, I don't even look on. like him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But I guess, uh, one of the places I like to start is like a little bit about yourself and, uh, who you are and what you do. Oh, yes. I'm an independent journalist, uh, currently based in Calgary, soon to be based in Edmonton. I okay. read about, uh, Alberta politics a fair amount. Um, I'm also interested in international politics and uh, arts and culture, uh, though I don't write about it as much as uh, maybe I should or would like to. Um, I have a newsletter on Substack called The Orchard. I, uh, prior to that, was a city hall reporter for a local online indie outlet called The Sprawl here in Calgary. Okay. And before, way before that, I was a reporter and columnist at the Medicine Hat News. Uh, ah. small town in southeastern Alberta. Well, I get it's city, but it's sm really small city. Uh, it's actually where Danielle Smith, our, our insane premier, is uh, mm -hmm. running uh, to get a seat in the legislature, even though she lives like three hours away. That's yeah. you know, I, I I met her last year for a cover I, a story I was covering for uh, the sprawl. Um, 
because she was a supporter of like the right wing mayoral candidate here. And at the time, right, she was a media personality uh, and she had been out of politics uh, since uh, she like torpedoed her career um, as leader of the opposition by crossing the floor to the governing party in 2014. Right. And then she didn't even win her nomination. So I, you know, I thought nothing of it, but I was, I was quite taken aback by her uh, affability. It was funny. It was right outside the Calgary Patrol Club where all these like lizard people hang out. <laughs> and um, she, she came out and she was wearing a mask because, you know, she had to at the time. And we're outside and I was, hey, can I talk to you about why you support Jeremy Marcus? And she was like, yeah, sure. Uh, do you mind if I take my mask off? when I speak and it's like it, this was like fall 2021 right like we knew that COVID okay, transmission yeah. outdoors wasn't much of a thing um, right. but I thought it was very courteous that uh, despite being uh, an anti masker she was like hey is it alright with you if I <laughs> right, my actually, mask off yeah. and uh, she's um, really gifted at like spinning a yarn of bullshit and doing it like with the utmost sincerity and uh, right in a way where it's like just she you know presents his common sense while at the same time is like well you know people may disagree with me and that's fine let's hear it you know and uh <laughs> so i you know she does have this weird uh likability that is uh off-putting and uh, somewhat unsettling <laughs> yeah considering some of the weird things she believes mm -hmm. so i guess uh <sighs> How how long have you been an independent journalist, and, and how did that journey kind of happen? Right, so I've been independent since uh, I got laid off at the Sprawl in October 2021, right after our municipal election. Um, it was a decision the um, the um, founder in EIC of the Sprawl, Jeremy Clausus. Uh, made it wasn't it wasn't like personal like he laid off all the staff he just decided he didn't want to run like a a, a growing news organization anymore he sort of wanted to take a step back and just oh you know I think he was somewhat confused about the direction he wanted to take Sprawl in and um, um, couldn't uh, handle the pressure of uh, needing to be a manager and worrying about like finances and all that um, fair enough. Yeah, which was uh, regrettable. I, I mean, I'm still friends with the guy. We hang out sometimes. Uh, I write for them uh, occasionally. Um, but uh, that sort of, you know, because I've never in a million years before um, consider being a full-time freelancer. It's like, I need someone to, like, bounce ideas off of and then, you know, give me story ideas so I'm not always just scrambling to find my own. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I think when you're thrown into that situation, you just do it, right? Like it's it's uh, um, you know, you know, uh, swim or drown type thing. I guess, yeah, 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 sink or swim or what have you. Yeah, yeah, sink or swim. Yeah, that was the phrase I was looking for. Um, and so yeah, I mean, luckily, uh, you know, since the pandemic, because I. I I got laid off from I my newspaper job, my like mainstream media job, job, where I was given a lot given of uh, leeway to uh, speak my mind, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, um, and part of that was part because, of that you know, it was a small you know, city, small right? No one was paying attention until people started paying attention. I had some leverage. But I got laid off due to COVID. Due to COVID. And at that time, I didn't even know they were in water anymore. Like, I was so burned out. So I, I was, like, I, I was thankful like, when she called me. I was like, you're temp my, my, my manager called me. My manager said that they're temporarily laying off. And then that temporary, that temporary layoff became permanent. But at the same time, we saw this in the independent media in Canada, which, you know, isn't enough to compete with the mainstream media in terms of resources at this point. But you saw outlets like Tapage and Vapel, really, you know, explode the breach, breach, which I've written about, which I've written for, rather, I've written about it. Also, 
came out at some point during the pandemic, during the pandemic, I forget why. Um, um, and, uh, and, you know, I've established good uh, you know, relations, relations, relations with, uh, with uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people these outlets. And, uh, and I've been uh, able to uh, find work there, find work there, the sort of, uh, sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of, sort you know, pretty much shut my face, much shut my face. Um, um, you know, my pitches, you know, my pitches, you know, get turned down, you get turned down, or just no reply. Right, right. So, I guess, how did you get into podcasting? Uh, well, I mean, so I have two podcasts, right? Big Shiny Takes and The Forgotten Corner, both on the Harbinger Media Network. And essentially, uh, you know, sort of two, I had sort of two group chats going with different friends from different parts of the country. Um, and we had always sort of joked about, or not, not joked about, but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess like floated the idea of doing a podcast to each other. And, right. uh, it was just something, you know, you never had time for. I was working a full-time job. It was totally burnt out. Um, then the pandemic happened. And uh, suddenly, uh, you know, we were all at home. Uh, by that point, I was like phoning into my newspaper job. I had really lost all uh, um, motivation. But it was like, all right, now that we're all at home all the time, let's let's do this. I mean, we've got all the time in the world. Nothing's happened. I mean, it's crazy thinking back to like the early days of the pandemic and how like, <laughs> yeah. You know, we all thought the world was going to end. So, like, we're all know, just we're hanging at home thinking we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I started uh, me and Eric and Marino, who I went to journalism school with in Toronto, uh, started Big Shiny Takes. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, Scott Schmidt, who uh, still works at Medicine Hat News, and our friend Mo Cranker, who also used to work at Mess and Hat News, he actually got laid off at the same time as me. Um, okay. Who, and he's our producer. Mo's our producer. But it's me and Scott. Occasionally, uh, Roberta Lexier, our friend uh, who's a professor at Mount Royal University here in Calgary, and okay. sits on the board of Harbinger. Okay. And yeah, we just did it, right? I mean, that was sort of. I, <laughs> You know, I like we all thought the world was gonna end. You know, there's a sense of why not, but there's also like, wow, this is such an opportunity for uh, so much uh, creativity to be explored. And uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of like looking on the bright side at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I mean, that's how it was. That's I wish awesome. there was a, a, a you know a more uh, interesting story <laughs> there. But it's yeah, always a uh, yeah. It's always like a, a group of guys that just want to get together and talk, and then it turns into a podcast sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty much. That That's it. I mean, Scott and I do more, like, interviews uh, on The Forgotten Corner. It's like a more of a serious show. Okay. We also do episodes where it's just us talking. Um But, um, yeah, and then you have Big Shiny Takes, which is more, you know, comedic. Shit right, posty. making fun of yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the one I, I I I've subscribed to the Forgotten Corner, but I don't think I've listened to it very much. Uh, I've been listening to Big Shiny Takes for quite a while, and uh, I definitely enjoy the the brow beating or the abuse of the right wing hack. <laughs> that's like my favorite thing. Yeah, because no one else is really doing it. Um, <laughs> not in the way we do it, right? No, um, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, Candleland, obviously, uh, I think overall does a very good job of uh, holding mainstream media to account. But yeah, there there's, you know, I mean, Jesse Brown's a pretty serious guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he um, and he does good work. He has a lot of bad takes, too. But um, whatever. <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair and uh you know i guess you know at, at like passage the v-day mr Atchie does a lot of media criticism but again it's very serious yeah it's formal uh, like it's not like just having a good yeah. time with it yeah and, and i do that too sometimes right when when, when i'm writing in you know mm -hmm. my newsletter or elsewhere but um I, I i think there's also because it's so infuriating just seeing all these like horrible 
mediocrities just be elevated uh, to these positions of influence without any intellect or talent that um, there's something (laughs) I think somewhat therapeutic about just um, treating them as the jokes they are. Um, You know, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, Matt Gurney or Tristan Hopper or, even you know on the more centrist side of things, Max Fawcett or uh, Martin Red Con. I mean, these people are clowns, all of them, um, <laughs> and uh, they should be shown no mercy. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I guess one of the things I, I like how do you, I didn't know most of the names of these columnists before I started listening to Big Shiny Takes. So is this a, a whole? Uh, like media sphere that you were aware of beforehand? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my uh, group chat with Eric and Marino, we, we, we came upon this idea of doing a podcast because we would always just share like horrible opinion columns in the group <laughs> chat and just like roast them. And it was like, we should nice. do a podcast of this. Um, I believe I came up with the name big shiny takes. We were just sort of spitballing and uh, that one. Yeah. Kind of so, stuck. uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> how old are you guys? Are you guys like in your uh, mid thirties? Maybe <laughs> did Big Shiny Takes exist for twenty year olds? Uh, Big Shiny Tunes definitely existed when I yeah. was uh, a, a, a teenager. Um, but the more formative ones I listened to, uh, Four was the one I had. I think it came out in like nineteen ninety nine. So when I was a kid, okay. Um, and then I remember a friend of mine, my cool friend in elementary school, who was into all the cool music and he got me into, uh, I remember burned me a copy of two and a copy of three. Um, and then I think my brother had five and six, my brother's a few years younger than me. Um, and so, yeah, no, there, there, but I, I would imagine, you know, zoomers, uh, I have and, no and idea. People outside of Canada, where, where, you know, the reference would go away about uh, right. Yeah, ad. if you didn't watch much music, then you don't know about Big Shiny Tunes, and if you right. don't know about Big Shiny Tunes, then, uh, yeah. well, I mean, much music's on TikTok now, so I don't know. Maybe the oh, kids are, right? are, are are watching it, um, but I, they're not releasing Big Shiny Tunes albums. I don't think. Uh, I hope not, because then uh, <laughs> you know they may get some lawyers. Uh, Right, you don't want to get the copyright. But uh, yeah. sorry, I, I totally digress. What, what, what did you ask me? Oh, geez, I don't even remember. <laughs> I think we kind of just went oh, off. Oh yes, on how our... calmness um, that you, you know you weren't that familiar with them. But yeah, we were. I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah. I think being in in the media sphere and spending too much time on Twitter, you get to know how all these people are, and you see. Um, that they really don't know what they're talking about. And in fact, often undermine the, the actual, you know, meat and bones journalism that their colleagues do. I mean, nowhere is that evident, more evident than at, uh, like every post media paper, um, right. you know, um, or at the national observer where, uh, um, you know, these, uh, their, their reporters do all this great work about how like Christy Freeland was lying about the cost of, uh, TMX, and then you have Max Fawcett absolutely swooning over her um, mm. without any substance or anything, just how you know it's sexist to uh, um, <laughs> die for um, Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and so that applies uh, at the star, too. I mean, uh, you know, the star, I mean, growing up, like that, that was my, like, vi- like, I wanted to be like a star columnist or reporter when I, when I, when I was growing up. I mean, I always read mm. the star um you know on, on saturdays especially and uh it, you know it does a lot of great investigative work but then it just drops these like turds from rosie demano or or uh you know martin red con or um you know other ridiculous people um that uh undermines uh their work and i think part of it is that when you have newspapers whose reporters are doing their jobs and therefore challenging power you need someone there (laughs) say actually power is great and (laughs) yeah that's right and the status quo is awesome yeah yeah maybe we can tinker with some things here there but mostly uh everything is great 
And um, yeah, that's what you're supposed to think. So here are the facts. And again, reporters aren't allowed to say what their opinions are. There are ways that you can kind of subtly do that through reporting. Yeah. But, you know, as a whole, you know, the, the, the opinions are just beaten out of you, um, you know, from when you start working there. And um, only once you get to a level um, of appropriate, like, fealty to power, then it's like, okay, you can have an opinion. Right, you're you're allowed. <laughs> and that's, and, and that's right. what, you know, people ask me when I criticize pundits, how do you define a pundit? And um, you know, I think what people have in their minds is just someone who goes on TV or podcasts or streams or whatever to express their opinions. But I think there's an important caveat there. I think a pundit is someone who go who's on TV on all these media outlets who are given the privilege to express their opinions because their opinions uphold the established mm. order. That's right. If you're not upholding the established order, right, um, it's hard to not, gain ground in the media mainstream stuff. So yeah, how can you be people pundit? do it? You know, yeah. I mean, people. Some people would say what I'm doing right now is punditry, and I would say it's not because I'm not, um, again, upholding the established order. I'm not uh, giving people a choice between Coke and Pepsi or the liberals and conservatives or you guys. Right. Crap. I guess it's how do you define punditry? Right. Like. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that I've talked with other people about is like the idea that we don't want to just be another pundit. We want to, you know, we want to have opinions and we want to, you know, express them, but we don't want to just be another talking head. That's like, yeah, the, the liberals are great and <laughs> whatever. Or Pierre, Pierre Polyevra is, is a good leader. <laughs> well, and there are a lot of pundits too, who uh, don't have any opinions. They literally just, um, you know, they offer their like timid analysis of uh, whatever is happening uh, that day, and they don't take sides. That you know, that, that's beneath <laughs> them, and um, that that's also like a, a really um, how <laughs> how do you analyze analyze things without you know taking a side, quote unquote, like or, or like you know criticizing people that are in power making decisions. Well, if you look at all the like uh, CBC, uh, you know, analysts like yeah. Aaron Wary and Jason Marcus off, I mean, that's what they do. It's um, here's my opinion, but I don't have any opinions. So yeah, it's just, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. and um, you know, and then when the CBC does commission, I mean, they had Robin Urbach uh, in charge of their uh, ill-fated opinion section where uh, she gave a Headley fan space to talk about how they think Jacob Hoggard is uh, completely innocent. Right. And right. Uh, essentially, I mean, most of uh, Nora Loretto actually back way back when uh, she was writing, I think in her own like medium blog uh, did like an, an analysis of the opinions that were being published by CBC opinion. And it was almost all, right wingers <laughs> or 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 centrists right there's right. barely any left opinions and so it ended up just being like robin urbach uh giving public handouts to her friends from the national post and um of course uh that didn't work out but she was immediately poached a columnist where um she writes just the most smug and dull uh, you know, center right opinions, um, surrounded by people who think she's brilliant, but uh, <laughs> she's not in that. You know, a lot of these pundits, I, they didn't like pay their dues, like as a reporter mm -hmm. covering crime. They, 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 you know, Matt Gurney too. They were just, they were just sort of immediately put on this pedestal where it's like, yeah, you have to listen to what this person's opinions are. You have to, they're they they form part of what like legitimate uh, elite opinion is and and, right. and you have to wonder why usually because they are related to somebody right <laughs> yeah because they're related to somebody or um or they're just um they just say the exact things that uh, yeah, people in power want to hear like tristan hopper i mean there's a fucking great example i mean i mean the guy's got nothing to say other than just like Fraser Institute talking points. Yeah. And yeah, he seems, I mean, again, he was national post columnist. He left to start some, some newsletter in Victoria that failed. 
Um, and he just circles back to the national post. Like it's nothing. <laughs> and, um, yeah. again, I can't think of anything Tristan Hopper has written that wasn't painfully dull and insipid, <laughs> but, yeah. um, it doesn't matter because yeah, he, um, says exactly what the hedge fund, uh, managers who own post media based in the States, uh, want him to say, right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I guess, uh, we've kind of betrayed it a little bit, uh, but, <clears throat> Uh, you're uh, on the left, right? <laughs> like you're. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, that's often used as a way to like describe, people, dismiss them, like, oh, they're on the left, they're on the far <laughs> left, right? And right. of course, um, you know, little history lesson for uh, your viewers: right wing and left wing come from the the organization of the French Congress after the Revolution, where. Um, yeah people who supported the monarchy and wanted to like retain as much of it as they could say on the right side, right? Conservatives. And then uh, the socialists who want to um, redistribute the, uh, you know, means of uh, production sat on the left and then liberals, uh, you know, were in the middle. So that, I mean, (laughs) <laughs> so, I, I mean that's a long way of saying, saying yes i am but i you know i think uh it was uh, uh um colombia's new president uh gustavo petro who said that this isn't like it's not the issues we're facing aren't about left and right they're about life and death so mm-hmm. like do you want to keep like drilling for fossil fuels for the benefit of like international corporations um, no? or do you not? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do you, do you want to keep making the rich richer and letting people suffer or not? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's just really existential now with the climate crisis, the risk of nuclear war, which is a whole other like can of worms that, um, yeah. I'm not sure we have time to open here, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, these are like deep existential issues. So these like lab- these like outdated labels, um, yeah, are, they don't have uh, as much know, purpose, I, right? Yeah, yeah, no, they don't. But at the same time, they do have like like people use them, so they do have discursive value. Uh, yeah. Just the fact that they're like drilled into all our brains, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost too bad that it's it is such a prevalent thing that uh, you can't. You can't discuss ideas uh, in a in like a existential way. Like, what are the repercussions of this? You have to be like, well, this is the the left opinion, and this is the right opinion, and these are the <laughs> these are the centrists, and and like, I know where I stand on pretty much every issue, and it tends to fall on the left. But it's just weird that we have to have this shorthand that, so that people can put us yeah. in the boxes. Like, I think guns are cool. Yeah. Sometimes you know what I mean. Like <laughs> I, 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 I don't think everyone should uh, have a gun, but I think that if you want to have a gun and you're responsible and uh, you know yeah. you you should be able to, um, sure. with you know, again, um, having to do some paperwork and, and find you know. <laughs> I guess, I, I, I'm I'm a gun centrist actually. I, <laughs> Okay, there you go. Yeah. Not on the left for guns, but centrist for guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's going to catch you somewhere. Oh. Um, so I guess um, I usually do a, a segment called Counter Propaganda. Uh, we're coming up on about a half an hour. So uh, is there anything that you think has people are misinformed about or that uh they need to be to learn more about why yes um (laughs) i would say uh the situation in haiti right now where canada and the u.s have just uh sent uh armored vehicles like airlifted armored vehicles to help uh, an unelected government uh suppress uh, both gang violence and popular protests Ah against the government, which, uh, again, is unelected. It was appointed by this coalition of, uh, you know, Western powers that have been uh, 
intervening in Haiti since uh, it launched the world's only uh, successful slave revolt in 1804. And um, the, um, and so after the assassination of their, their, their previous president, um, and he decided to increase the price of fuel to get rid of uh, government subsidies, which I'm sure he came to completely independently and mm-hmm. not um, at the behest of uh, Western capital. And um, yeah, so can they're sending can, and there's barely been any reporting on it. And to the extent that there has been like in the CBC, Evan Dyer did a piece on it. Doesn't it all talk about like the root causes or the history of, uh, U.S. intervention. It's just like here's why gas is is, is uh, uh, such a big issue in in, in Haiti. And it, I mean, mm. it, it it wasn't a bad piece. I I, I don't think. But um, again, there's there's just so many more angles to explore, and you're pretty much not seeing it in in, in the Canadian media from from what I can tell. Uh, maybe like the business section of Globe Mail has some stuff. You know. <laughs> you read the business press, and you know that's a good way to find out. Yeah, what they uh, want you to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but also things that wouldn't get um, mm-hmm. reported to the general public. And you know, you, you look at it, and you're like, "Okay, this," but what about from the opposite perspective? Right, right, yeah, yeah. That you don't necessarily I, uh, see. In- I didn't know much about uh, uh, Haiti, uh, like in the current events, but I've recently been hearing more and more about their history and how like they had the only, like the main, uh, <clears throat> the successful slave revolt. And then, uh, they refused to have like friendly, uh, to Western power, uh, governments in place. And as a result, like, uh, like U S and Canada and various other powers kept like, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, they wouldn't. Sh- they wouldn't trade with them because they weren't doing right. They embargoed the way they them. Yeah, the embargoes. They, yeah, they pulled up armadas of uh, you know dozens of ships and thousands of soldiers to intimidate them. And then the U.S. Li- actually occupied Haiti. Um, uh, you know, in 1914 under w- Woodrow Wilson. You know, um, it, it, on the grounds of they wanted to restore order. Which is right. literally exactly what uh, Ariel Henry, the uh, current uh, tyrant in charge of Haiti, is saying he he needs support from Western countries to do right. Mm. Um, you know, you you don't want uh, the the you know poorer nations getting uh, too out of hand. You know, they might start <laughs> talking about redistributing wealth and expropriating Western right. uh, corporations. Um, so yeah, I think that's a story. Uh, I'm working on a piece right now uh, for an outlet called The Maple, which I think I mentioned earlier. Um, that uh, should be out at some point in the next few days. So cool, cool. Look for that. That's awesome. Like yeah, I um, it, the story of Haiti is a very interesting one. Like overall, and like for some reason, uh, this small country is a, a punching bag for like Western uh, capital. Like, it's just, it's very strange to me. Like, they couldn't just let them be. They have to continue to abuse them over and over again because they didn't fall into line, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And, it, it, I, you know, it's not a coincidence that it's the consistently the poorest or one of the most poor or one of the poorest countries in uh, yeah. the the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that was, I think, actually uh, reading Noam Chomsky talk about uh, Haiti. Uh, in Israel and Palestine was how I sort of realized I was, uh, you know, left, <laughs> right. uh, anti-imperialist. Um, yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. So I also do a segment called Foes and Comrades. <laughs> so foes are people that you think uh, need to be called out for being shitty or uh, that people should either not pay attention to or uh, go and harass online or, or, or comrades or people that you think uh, deserve a shout out and that are awesome. So do you have anyone for foes or comrades? Well, yeah, I would say my uh, choices are uh, directly uh, interrelated. Uh, <laughs> um, the the uh, Edmonton police service um, oh. who are the foes in the story a couple weeks ago, 
uh, charged uh, Edmondson journalist Duncan Kinney, who edits the Progress Report, of defacing a statue of uh, Roman Shukovich outside of the Ukrainian Youth Unity Complex. Um, now, Roman Shukovich was a Nazi. Right. Uh, like, un- undeniably a Nazi. He killed, you know, he, he was responsible for killing thousands of Poles and law Jews. And Ukrainians, I don't, I don't mean, not all Ukrainians, but uh, very uh, influential, um, powerful uh, segment of Ukrainians in Canada think he was a, a swell guy and that he actually secretly fought the Nazis. Um, now, what's especially uh, troubling about this arrest, well, no, I, I guess not arrest, but this charge, is that Duncan did a story on this defacement of the monument. So okay. they're accusing him of faking a news story, right? Staging a news story. Oh, and so, so uh, and it, wow. That's quite the so, ac- accusation. Right. And so Duncan uh, is, I, I mean, the idea, he's a, a, an outspoken critic of the Edmonton Police Service, uh, very uh, vociferous in his criticisms of them uh they've already tried to uh deny him press credentials um the, the, i mean edmonton police um they have an enemies list with, uh, which he's on uh bashir mohammed uh uh, uh activist there who uh he know he lives in vancouver now i think but um okay. he was on that list mike jans a city councillor um, so yeah, I mean, this is a police service with an enemies list, and they're wow. using the weight of the state to uh, frame uh, an independent journalist. And all the the usual National Post goons <laughs> are say they're just saying he did it. Um, of course. And Canadian press piece, uh, and I don't think he did. If he did do it, I'm going to be very mad at him. And of course, that destroys his credibility as. I know him, and I that would strike me as wildly out of character if he did that. Um, because like, why would you risk that? Why, why right, would you risk yeah. that when, like, if anything, tell your friend to go do it, <laughs> you, you, you know, which is <laughs> yeah, unethical right. as well. I'm not, but but right. that's like like going there and doing it yourself. And he's also reported on how they got a new like security installation there. So, like, so he knows I, that the- <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. It's clearly an effort to drag Duncan through the mud. Yeah. And it's one thing to see like psychopaths who write for the National Post do it. But then to see the timidity of these like liberal blue check reporters mm. who, um, when their colleagues are uh, threatened by law enforcement and arrested, they're the first to denounce it as they should. But when Duncan does it, uh, I mean, they can't even bring themselves to call him a journalist, um, let alone say uh, this is extremely troubling and an assault on press freedom, um, in, it, it, unless it proves to be true. Um, and uh, so I find that really uh, infuriating and uh, uh, disappointing. Sure. Um, so uh, on that note, Comrade would be uh, Duncan Kinney of the Progress Report. Um, I've I've written for the Progress Report a bunch. Um, I think it's a credible news outlet, and uh, want to make clear because the Canadian press made this mistake. Uh, in addition to saying that he did it rather than he allegedly did it or is accused of doing it, um, Press Progress and Progress Report are separate right. news outlets. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They, don't, they don't have anything to do with each other, but both are very good, and uh, you should yeah. support both of them uh, after you support my newsletter um, and uh, my podcast. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Duncan's done a lot of great work on holding the police to account. Um, he's broken stories, um, which is... Uh, Typically, behavior you would associate with a journalist. Yep. yep. Um, stories that were picked right. up by the mainstream media without any credit, which is another thing besides the word that's same in their name that press progress and progress report have in common. And um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm really proud of a lot of the work I've done for him. And uh, I think that while some might find his style to be 
um, excessively uh, abrasive towards the police, his sort of lines of questioning and stuff. I think at the end of the day, uh, that doesn't matter. And um, you have to look at the substance of uh, what journalists do, what, what, what work they produce. Right. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I mean, um, in, in some quarters, there's no such thing as politics. It's just tone and affect, right? And right. I reject that wholeheartedly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think some of the people with the most uh, affable tones are the most, like, dangerous dipshits out there because they're, what they're advocating is uh, fundamentally anti-human. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so if you do it with a, a chuckle and a grin, I, I mean, I don't care. It doesn't yeah, matter to yeah. me. I, I'm more interested in uh, people who get the goods. And I don't know, maybe it's just because of who I am, but I, I quite embrace and enjoy abrasive people who are against the police. <laughs> like, that's a good thing to be abrasive to the cops, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, I, I think some would argue that you could do the same things in a different tone. Right. And I, you know, I, I, I think some, some of the way, some of his lines of questioning, I would ask the same thing in a different way. But at the end of the day, it's meaningless. It's superficial um, tone policing. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I would expect better from Canadian journalists, but on the other hand, I absolutely would not. Um, right. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, and I think just because it stands out because, um, again, uh, uh, what I was saying earlier, reporters are, uh, bred to beat all their opinions out of themselves. You can't even show, uh, a, a slight bias. Yeah. While, um, you know, these columnists are almost all right wing or, you know, neoliberal uh, technocrats are allowed to say whatever they want with no uh, professional repercussion. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why we do big training tapes. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, so I guess uh, the one thing I didn't ask earlier before the uh, uh, counter propaganda was I wanted to ask you what the like journalists, uh, what the field of journalism looks like in Canada right now, because it seems like, uh, I mean, we talk, we've been talking a lot about columnists who are right wing. Right. And I see a lot of journalists who do really good work that are considered leftists who don't seem to get any work and have all have, have to have a sub stack and they constantly are advocating for themselves where, or writing books and not getting published by, uh, mainstream media. So it just seems like like what is it? What does it look like to you in that way? Yeah, well, I, I think you described it uh, quite aptly. Um, that um, news uh, newspapers and uh, to a lesser extent broadcast media is increasingly being gutted. Um, so these mm -hmm. fat cats who don't give a shit about journalism or any of these uh, lofty values you're taught in journalism school of like seeking the truth and um speaking truth uh, to power and fairness <laughs> yeah um yeah they um so, so it's increasingly precarious so mm -hmm. reporters are expected to do more and more work with less and less resources and on top of it there's this you know this was why when i was in mainstream news this was you know made explicit to us that the the, the goal for the person who uh owned the paper and I mean, these people, these media moguls, they all know each other. They socialize. They go to the same parties. Was to just have us essentially become press release uh, rewriting machines and just right. write quick, short stories. Here's what this person in power says. And then um, if you want to offer a different perspective, yeah, well, just you'll, you'll do it for the next story. But then, of course, <laughs> you just get more and more press releases and enough time for that. Yeah. So meanwhile... Meanwhile, while they're spending less and less on reporting, um, all these uh, pundits have a massive megaphone to just spew their ignorance. And um, they're the ones, too, who are like voluntarily knowing the substack and making even more money um, because they don't right. have any overhead. Um, 
And so while I think that, uh, you know, independent media does provide some uh, cause for optimism, it also seems to replicate a lot of the pre-existing power structures of the mm-hmm. mainstream media, right? Like the line is, is I think, the, probably the biggest substack in Canada. And it's, it's literally just uh, the National Post or Globe and Mail page uh, repackaged to be edgy and subversive. It's the same slob. Mm-hmm. And, um, but at the same time, uh, having that independence does allow people who break outside this uh you know mold of corporate media to find a larger audience and to to speak without fear of like uh being disciplined professionally uh for doing so um you know that uh, the one thing i like about Substack is i'll 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 pitch a piece to a bunch of mainstream outlets no one will want it so i put it on Substack. i'm like hey this piece wasn't mainstream media multiple mainstream media outlets didn't want to publish this piece so uh, yeah let me know if you think it was uh up to par and um and, and then there's a whole other issue with new media of like sort of creating this feedback loop between yourself and your audience which i'm sure is something you've grappled with as a as a streamer right that um once you know what your audience likes Right. Yeah. And, My audience you know, isn't big they, enough yet, so I don't have that, but. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I'm in, sort of yeah. in the same boat. The yeah. sub stack is really taken off this month, which is. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, good. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I, 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 things are pretty bleak, but you've got to, uh, um, you know, to avoid just, um, you know, going insane. You have to have some <laughs> morsel of, of hope that uh better things are around the corner and uh so i guess uh we're coming up on just about 50 minutes uh you have the orchard on substack what is some of the stuff that you've been covering on the orchard lately well it turns out people love uh danielle smith comment content um, oh yeah <laughs> yeah because i mean she's like uh you know it's almost she right she's like a talk radio like on the shock jock um, prior to entering politics. And now she uh, has the levers of power because she was able to sign up enough uh, new members for the Alberta's ruling uh, conservative party yeah. from rural areas who, um, you know, either don't believe COVID is real or don't believe we should do anything about it. <laughs> and um, so uh, for one, I, I, I dug into, she has a, uh, social media page on locals.com, which is uh, created by a guy named Dave Rubin. Do you know who Dave Rubin? Is? I know Dave Rubin. Well, not personally, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I know who he is. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he is like, he is the lowest of hang- low hanging fruit. And, yeah, I've disliked him for a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I remember when he was claiming to like be on the left, but also right. like wanting to engage with the far right. Now he's just like a run the mill conservative surprise. He, he was part of the uh, atheist community, which is where I was located at that time. Yeah, he started out that way, right? He was yeah. like a big stint for Sam Harrison, yep. Sam Harris. And then, like a lot of Sam Harris fans, uh, I mean, once you accept that Western civilization is superior, right? It's like, yeah, actually, Christianity's pretty cool. You know? Full blown reactionary. <laughs> yeah, I and uh, but, anyways, he yeah. created this free speech social media page where uh, basically uh, you set up an account and then you post, and you have this community of supporters. You can also post, and then. It, kind of like Substack, but it's a social media page, right? Like people can pay and then get exclusive content. Um, so okay. on Smith's page, they she had seven hours of AMAs with wow. her paid subscribers. So I watched all seven of those. That's and wrote awful. a piece about it. <laughs> now while I was working on it, that little weasel in Toronto or Montreal, I think he lives in Montreal actually. Justin Ling. Oh yeah, scooped me. <laughs> and he reported on and then all these mainstream news reports were like, as first reported by independent journalist Justin Lang. And I was like, oh, that could Bastard. be me. Except if, it, except if it was me, they would just say they took it. Because, I mean, Justin Lang is like an establishment, mainstream, uh, blue yeah. check. He's a name. CAJA journalist, yeah. Um, so, you know, 
the, the mainstream media has no trouble giving him credit, but I suspect if it was me, they would not. Yeah. Um, so I did, but that 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 piece did really well. Like I, I can't complain. It, it, it sort of uh, got a lot of attention in the newsletter. Um, so I've been writing a lot, a lot about Alberta politics, uh, stuff uh, with our healthcare, um, which is uh, like healthcare systems everywhere has this massive staffing shortage. And Danielle Smith says that this was like a deliberate plan by Alberta Health Services to sort of, uh, um, <laughs> you know, impose this like um, globalist conspiracy okay. on Alberta. So they have an That's agreement with the Economic Forum, which I wrote about today. That actually you'd think it would be something she supported because it's like uh, yeah. this this partnership with other international like health bodies to determine how to cut costs. Yeah. Um, yeah. For healthcare, so it's like that's what she supports. Um, she wants to spend less and, money on healthcare. So. <laughs> yeah, and I wrote about that today. Uh, you know, I've been writing. I had an op-ed I wrote about uh, the uh, IRA definition of anti-Semitism that mm -hmm. um, is being used as a as a means of uh, you know silencing criticism of Israel uh, quite explicitly. Um, like calling it an apartheid state, which uh, if that's any smack, then like every human rights organization in the world, including those in Israel, are not smack. And uh, so I wrote an right. op-ed about that, and I pitched it to a couple mainstream media outlets, which I'm not going to name, in the event that one day they come to their senses and publish me. Um, but one turned it down, one just didn't get back to me. Um, so I published it on Substack, um, and that did quite well. And, um, yeah, I mean, I try and, uh, I try cause for Canadian foreign policy is something I, 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 I think is there aren't a lot of people talking about Canadian foreign policy, uh, from a left-wing perspective and doing it right. to my satisfaction. Okay. Um, so I try and write about foreign policy, uh, a bunch um I, I sort of eschew usually the the you know hot take uh substack uh um sort right. of um um it can be done yeah it can be tough with the demand like I try to and talk produce content right <laughs> yeah yeah but you know I, I i like to talk to people who know more about stuff than i do and and um, right. sort of uh, have an in, in informed analysis that way. But I also uh, um, am not shy to express my opinions. And I like doing media criticism too, which I sort of uh, haven't done a piece of exclusively media criticism in a while, but I, I do like putting it in there if there's a story I think does a really bad job like deconstructing it. Like There's a piece in the Canadian press um, uh, last week talking about how the World Economic Forum is uh, sort of a source of conspiracy theories on the left and the right. Really? Um, and it's like the left the thinks left? it's a cons <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it explains what the left wing conspiracy is. And it's like, oh, so like actually what the World Economic Forum does. <laughs> like what and they're doing is a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Like uh, cutting public services and uh, destroying the environment. And I mean, yeah, because of the COVID, they've taken a step back for that with their great reset. But right, right. but but it's also clearly uh, a means of uh, maintaining the um, status quo of global capitalism, just doing it in a way that's more palatable to the unwashed masses. Is there any um, clue as to like because uh, how the quote unquote, great reset became a conspiracy about how they were going to install communism. Cause it didn't seem like that when I was reading about it. <laughs> so I don't know where they got that idea. Yeah. Well, I think it builds on a larger literature of this like uh, new world order, you know, one world government conspiracism that just sees these inst international institutions of, uh, as trying to like destroy uh you know state boundaries and impose a single world government and i mean uh you know the great reset it talks about how you know capitalism needs to be reformed right yeah and that companies yeah. need to look 
at more than just their profit margins. Um, and, I suppose, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and like Danielle Smith, for example, she talks about that in one of her AMAs that I wrote about, and she's saying that these these radical environmentalists are using, uh, um, you know, uh, like corporate uh, sustainability as this Trojan horse to bring private industry under the control of the state, which would then be brought under the control of this like global uh, yeah. cabal, right? Yeah, the global. So that, like, I think. <laughs> I think it's just, uh, you know, old wine and new bottles. Mm, fair enough. All right, I guess um, we're almost at an hour. Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter.com at Jeremy Appel 1025. Uh, my newsletter is uh, The Orchard at theorchard.substack.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram at appel.jeremy. Uh, I've never plugged my Instagram before, but uh, here we go. <laughs> nice. um, and yeah, exclusive I, I mean, content. You can, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can also read my work, uh, not just on my Substack, but in the Maple and the Breach and Ricochet and uh, various uh, independent media outlets. Um, and oh yes, uh, listen to both my podcasts, The Forgotten Corner and Big Shiny Takes, both on the Harbinger Media Network, uh, which I would encourage you to, uh, after you've checked out both my podcasts, check out some other shows on the network, uh, including The Progress Report. Uh, that's <laughs> and <podcast> Press Progress. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's true. Press Progress does have a new podcast on, uh, on uh, Harbinger, which is called Sources. I thought it should be called the press broadcast, but you know, you're not. <laughs> I guess. Right on. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, great to be here, Corey. Uh, I, uh, I have a blast. All right, folks, that's everything. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical, skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics. Uh, you can check out the videos that I do with my friend Damien Marie at Hope and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. You can also find the links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. Uh, you can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for watching or listening, and try to get involved with something in your area. And let's all work to make the world a better place. <laughs>